All right, so we're going to take a look at some information. You, um, we're going to take a look at some historical facts in this video and see whether or not we can identify this entity that is Esau or Edom in the world today. Like I said, I'm not just going to use scripture, but I'm going to use historical facts. Because I know many of us truth seekers have grown really wary of all these unlearned uh, so-called believers and the creator yet they don't read his word a day in their lives so this video is dedicated to those who profess to be believers yet do not read his word or believe some of the things that are contained within the prophecies of scripture and some of the biblical characters that it speaks about so we're going to take a look and observe all these clues that I gathered from my last two videos if you haven't watched them please go back and watch them so you could understand what it is I'm talking about and just who is this Esau or these nations of Esau called Edom in the world today I recommend that you go back and watch those videos. Uh, they're kind of long, but especially if you are one of those that, like I said, does not like reading the word of the Creator or is just still stuck in a love gospel because His word is not just a love message. I said it before and I'll say it again. The scriptures are very much alive today. And the Old Covenant is a history book that does not only speak about future events but it says a lot about our past the new covenant deals a lot with grace love and the direction uh, the son of the creator wants us to go and how he wants us to be to change so with that being said let's take a look at all the clues I've gathered so far and we're gonna see who is this entity who are these people of Edom okay so clue number one we found out that Esau was red and hairy that's our first clue and also in Genesis 25 verse 30 it said that Esau had a thing for red pottage now there's a theory that some say that this red pottage was actually blood or rare meat. And for those of you that don't know, the scriptures have a few words to say in regards to eating blood or consuming food that contains blood in it. Genesis 9-4, God gave instructions to Noah and told him that he is not to eat meat with blood in it. Why? Leviticus 17 11 says that life is in the blood. What does that mean? In other words, the blood holds the soul. The soul is in the blood. So, I don't know if some of you out there probably met or know somebody that likes to eat rare meat, but this is one of the traits of Esau. He was showing very much cannibalistic traits. That's what that red pottage was. Of course, you're not going to find this information. It's very well uh, concealed. But it's very much true. It's very much true. If you sit down and closely examine the passages, you'll come to find out that this red pottage was indeed bloody meat or rare meat, meaning the meat is not properly cooked. And again, as the scriptures say, you are to eat meat, that's fine, but 
you are to make sure it's properly cooked. Genesis 9.3 says that God told Noah that everything that lives and moves will be for food. He said that he gave him green plants as food and now he gives him everything else but that he is to abstain from consuming meat with blood in it. And Esau had a thing for rare meat, meaning meat with blood in it. Clue number two. We found out that Esau or Edom would conquer the earth by war. And Esau's father Isaac blessed the older brother of Jacob with the art of war. How do I know this? Well, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 40 says that Esau will live by the sword, and he was to serve his younger brother with it. But instead, what did he do? He tried to use that same blessing he was blessed with to persecute his brother. He tried to kill him. So rather than serving him, he tried to cause him harm. And it was also prophesied that there would come a time when these nations of Edom would have dominion and once they would rise to power they would break free from this spiritual yoke that was around their neck that kept them on a short leash and once they got off from that leash they would just run completely wild on the rest of the world so he was blessed with the blessings of weaponry and he would conquer through those blessings. He would live by the sword and through war. Also, keep in mind that Edom, the Edomites, dwelt, their original dwelling place was in Mount Seir. So, how will they dwell in the fatness, the best parts of the earth? They would conquer by the sword through war. Remember, Isaac prophesied that Esau would live in the best parts of the earth. And they would acquire those best areas that are around the world through the sword, through war. They will conquer and set up shop. Clue number three, it says that Esau or Edom would do space travel. And that their symbol would be the eagle. If you read that chapter of Obadiah, you'll come to understand that this is very much true. Esau or Edom would do space travel and their symbol would be the eagle. And let me read that chapter to you guys from uh, Obadiah where it speaks about Edom if I could just find it here give me one second okay Obadiah here here we go okay so Obadiah um, there's only one chapter so the book of Obadiah says Okay, so here it is. Obadiah, chapter 1 and verse 4 says that the Edomites exalt themselves as the eagle, and they set their nest amongst the stars. And from there, said the Lord, will he bring them down. Now, in 1969, who went to the moon and proclaimed the eagle has landed? That would be the United States of America. For those of you that don't know, this is a historical fact. It can be proven. They So basically, Obadiah 1.4 is prophesying that they would do space travel. 
that's what it means by setting their nest amongst the stars. Right now, not just the U.S., but other Edomite nations have space programs. They're setting up shop in space, and a lot of them use the eagle as their symbol. That is our third clue that I just mentioned. They would do space travel, and their symbol would be the eagle. That's why it says that they exalt themselves as the eagle, and they set their nest amongst the stars. Again, America set their nest amongst the stars on the moon in 1969, and they proclaimed the words, the infamous words, the eagle has landed. So you can begin to see that this entity, these people of Edom, are very much alive and with us today. Now, what was the symbol of the Greek back in ancient times? The eagle. Somewhere between the late 1300s, early 1400s, it was a symbol used for the Greek Orthodox Church when they converted them. Though they were Edomites, when they were converted, you know, when the gospel was preached to them, they were still distinguishable because they what? They would use that symbol to distinguish themselves. No matter how good they try to hide themselves, so the other nations wouldn't identify them, they were still haughty enough that even though they tried to hide other people's history, their own would stick out because of their arrogance. They just can't keep themselves from showing their pride in their nation, showing the pride of their nation. Though they hide everyone else's history, theirs is very much in the open, and that's enough to reveal who they are today. So what was the symbol of the Romans? The eagle. The eagle was a symbol extremely important to the Roman military. So everywhere they went, everywhere that they conquered, that was their symbol. There are many nations that bear their symbol. The Roman Empire was their main headquarters back in the days. And now it's their main headquarters as far as, not military speaking, but spiritually speaking. Their religious headquarters are still in Rome today in what we call the Vatican. So they are very much alive and well. And that's not just the only place that they are dwelling. Again, they dwell within our own nation of United States of America. Now, moving on. What was the symbol of the Spanish during the times of Columbus? The eagle. From 1475 to 1508, it was the royal flag of the Catholic monarchs, the Spanish Inquisition and all that. During those times, Esau was, his people, the Edomites, were cleansing their nation from all the pagan, heathenistic uh, inhabitants during that time. But at the same time, keep in mind, just because I'm mentioning Spain as being a nation of Esau, the, of Edom, it does not mean that other people weren't there. For example, the Israelites, uh, a few tribes of the people of Israel, were there at the time of the Inquisition. They were in the middle of all this chaos. Now, the Catholics did not mean any harm. Regardless, these Gentiles, they actually meant to cleanse their area from I believe it was the Moors and the Canaanite. They meant well, but remember, it was said that Esau always persecuted Jacob. So in the midst of all this, they weren't having anything, so they wanted to make sure that their uh, beliefs were being uh, honored. 
and whether that meant persecuting Jacob, Israel, more than likely, but don't get it mixed up. There might have been some that remained there. It was prophesied that, it is prophesied that some of the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Sepharad, which is what we call today uh, the Iberian Peninsula, where Portugal and Spain is, that they will be gathered from there. So there might be some people there still. We don't know, even though it's a nation that is being run by Edom, just like America is today. It's being run by the Edomites, but what? There's still people from other nationalities, other creeds. So to say that all these nations are just Edomites and all the people there are bad, it's very ignorant and stupid to think that way. So there were some... Esau always, keep in mind, Esau always tried to uh, follow God through the conversion which Paul was speaking about to these Gentiles. However, they always had a tendency to go astray. They, they, were, they couldn't seem to stay grounded very long in these spiritual matters. Though the Spanish men good at the time, sometimes it did got carried away and ended up persecuting some people that they shouldn't have. And I'm referring, of course, to Israel. You know, so just keep that in mind. Now, what was the French too of the... I'm sorry, what was the symbol of the French? The eagle. During the times of Napoleon, the wars of Napoleon, they used to fly the eagle. That was their symbol. So everywhere they went, it was the eagle, eagle, eagle. Everywhere they conquered, that's what that's how they represented their nations. So remember it, it was prophesied that he would rule, that Esau would rule at one point in history. So, they were all over the place. Now again, what was the symbol of Germany during the times of Hitler? The eagle. And what is the symbol of America? The eagle. This symbol can be found all over American coins, paper money, and even the United States coat of arms, etc. So a lot of people consider America uh, Esau's military in the world today. It used to be Rome. Everything used to be at Rome. But now they say that some people like to consider America their, their uh, headquarters as far as military goes. But their main headquarters as far as religion goes, it's in the Vatican, Rome. With the papacy and all that, that's where they are there. They like to play the lamb, you know, wolves dressed as lambs. And over here, they got their army men. So even though they're split off, they're still one entity. Because remember, a lot of the... Um, pagan statues and symbols that are in the Vatican can be found in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. So that lets you know that that there's still a connection between the U.S. and Rome. So don't let them throw you off. They're still both one and the same. Though America might show just a little slightly differences in beliefs, but it's the same thing. The Catholics are Christian Catholics. America's got all these denominations, but they're all in Babel. It's all one big uh, uh, cup full of lies, so to speak. And again, what is the symbol of Russia? A double-headed eagle. It's a symbol used in Freemasonry, and today... It's used in Russia's coat of arms. So they share that in common with America. Their coat of arms is an eagle. The only difference is Russia's has two heads. Their eagle has two heads, a double-headed eagle. So again, Esau is everywhere. And I'm just mentioning 
the nations, the strongest nations, or the nations with the most history at one point or history. So clue number four. It says Esau or Edom would rule the world last, and then Israel would rule. Obadiah 121 says that Saviour shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So before Israel set up, before Israel comes back into being again, gets gathered up, that means that Esau will be ruling last. How do I know this? Well, again, in the Apocrypha, God explains. Now, the Apocrypha is the other uh, books that were removed from the Bible, the seven books that the Protestants considered uninspired or, or unbiblical. For some reason or another, they considered them not that they shouldn't be in the canon for some reason or another. Yet they call these same books Apocrypha, which means hidden. Kind of funny, right? That they would do this? Well, at least the only thing I could say about this is at least the Catholics still have the Apocrypha in their scriptures. As bad as they are in religion, you know, they got their own form of worshiping, but... At least they have the Apocrypha in there. They did not remove it. And you can verify this. You could go to the Latin Vulgate. It's the Protestants here in America. All these denominations. If you notice, every, almost every Bible here in America doesn't have the Apocrypha. Or they consider it separate. Why? Why would they do that? Removing chapters, you know, like Second Estras. And that's where I'm going to get it right now. So in the Apocrypha, God explains that Esau, or these Edomite nations, is the last kingdom before Israel is set up. Now I'm going to read Genesis 25-26 where it, it explains that Esau was born first and Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel. Now, what does this mean? A lot of people just overlook this. They don't think much of it. But if you would read Second Estras from the Apocrypha, chapter 6 and verse 8, it says that Jacob and Esau were born unto Isaac, and Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. What does that mean? Second Estras 6.9 Next verse says that Esau is the end of the world. And Jacob is the beginning of it that follow it. Again, this proves without a shot of a doubt who will be ruling last prior to God's kingdom being set up. Esau would be ruling last. And he's ruling now with his associates through the United Nations. You see that? This is historical facts. Scripture and historical facts go hand in hand. Now you can see why they removed the Apocrypha. Because Second Estras 6, 8 and 6, 9 perfectly explains who would be ruling prior to Jacob being restored again. Esau. Now you know why a lot of, again, these apocryphas aren't found in the canon, especially here in America. So Esau's everywhere. He's been trying to conceal himself for so long, but as the scripture says, that nothing hidden will remain hidden. Everything would be brought out into the open and the truth would be made known, especially in these latter days. So let's examine the clues again. And I'm going to be using the Native American Indians as an example. Okay, so clue number one. 
Native American Indians are different shades of red-brown, not pink-red, and none of them are hairy. But the so-called ruddy man is bold red and hairy. Esau was red and hairy. So, remember, are Native Americans smooth skin or hairy? It's, an, it's a simple question to answer. I haven't met a, a pure Native American Harry. They're smooth skinned people. So what 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 red could the scriptures be talking about? It's talking about ruddy, turning red, not being one color red. So this is talking about pink red. Where am I what am I trying to say? That the so called European man is Esau, and I'm not talking about Japheth. Don't confuse Japheth, Noah's son. Don't confuse him with Esau. Esau was red, red-haired, pinkish, and hairy. That's the only type of individual today with those characteristics. Though he spread all over the place, yes, and he even mixed with Japheth. But, like I said, Use the sermon in everything you do. Clue number two. Have Native American Indians conquered anyone since they were put on reservations after they were conquered during the Civil War? No, but the so-called European man has conquered all nations and lived in the best parts of the land, just as it was prophesied, just as we read now. So none of these characteristics describing Esau fit these natives of this lands, and I'm using them as an example. Because Esau likes to say that they are Jacob when they fit none of the descriptions of Jacob. They fit the descriptions of Esau, but they do that on purpose. They switch. They do a, to throw you off, they do a psyops, reverse psyops. Clue number three are Native Americans doing space travel. Nope. Who land, again, who landed on the moon in 1969 and proclaimed the eagle has landed? The so-called man from Europe, who is Edom Esau. And again, I'm not talking about Jafet. Jafet shared that. that uh, the only thing he, uh, Esau has in common with Jafet is that they both could be mistaken from the same color. But Jafet is not hairy and he's not red. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch my video I did on Noah so you could understand the difference between Japheth and Esau. So clue number four. Are Native American Indians currently ruling to be the last kingdom before Israel set up, just as it was prophesied? No, but the so-called European man is ruling the world. Their logo is everywhere in a lot of nations. Though they, they might have conquered a lot of places. Remember, it was said that they are small among the heathen. Even then, they are still not very numerous. They are powerful because they were prophesied to inherit weaponry. So they have the weapons. That's how they rule. They're not numerous where they could outnumber everyone else, but they're very strong in the arts of war. So, goes to show you who they are today. So, for all you skeptics, the scriptures are very much alive. And a lot of these characters that you read about are present with us today. But because these same wicked governments have switched the truth to convince us to believe the lie. That's why it pays to do your own research, do your own studying. Don't take my word for it. You're probably just as shocked as I was when I found out, but remember, it's commanded. I'm not sure what chapter or what verse it is, but it says, you will not hate your brother Esau. Some of you brothers take this way too out of like 
I understand that I understand that Esau is said to be hated by everyone, but some of these brothers just go off with it and just pour more fuel to the fire. God commanded that you are not to hate Esau. He's going to deal with him. He's vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So, and another thing, a lot of you brothers, by, you know, spilling your hate and animosity, you're no better than Esau when you do that. And you know what? It was said that uh, Canaan and Esau had a lot of friction between each other at one point in history during the the Punic Wars. During the times of Hannibal and Rome, they were going at it with each other. And a lot of you show your true colors by only always talking about Esau. Esau, you cannot see that there, though Esau may be in power, there's somebody higher than him behind the shadows. And I notice that a lot of people don't talk about that group. And I'm going to get to that in another video. But like I said, a lot of people out there just take it way out of hand. And rather than just show the truth for what it is, they like to, you know, wild out, just, you know, express their hatred. Oh, we know who they are. We're going to do... You're not, listen, you ain't going to do nothing to Esau. Though you may be, you know, whatever you are, think you're strong, whatever. Listen, Esau will take you out easy. He's got the weaponry, and he knows, like, the hardcore Edomites, they know their time is up, and they're itching for you to start something. So the last thing you want to do is provoke them or they want to start civil unrest so you want to be one of those fools that gives them that pleasure go right ahead i wouldn't advise it though but hey if you're going to show your colors because the scriptures say we'll know you by your fruits like i said there's a lot of animosity between canaan and esau and you might just find out that the shoe might fit. If it does, wear it. Again, I just hope that people start opening their eyes because there's a lot of truth in the scriptures and a lot of people put it out there for their own agendas and purposes. So I just want to shed some light in it. I know a lot of people know about this already. But I'm putting out there my own version of the truth, and I take it simply as that. There's no intention on these people of Esau. You know, I don't have anything against them. Whatever wrong they've done to me, that unknowingly, or my family, or any of my loved ones, I'll let God deal the judgments with these people because. You know, we don't know. Some of us might even come from these uh, people, you know. We don't know. But we certainly don't back them up. And we think what we're, what they're doing is wrong. So, like I said, we are commanded to love our enemies. God is the one that judges, not man. You can be angry, but if you hold hate in your heart, that still will be counted against you. Just expose the truth, bring it to light, and for those that have ears to hear, will hear, those that don't, won't, those with eyes to see, will see, and those that don't, won't see. So, there are too many clues for us to be ignorant. Some are unlearned in the scriptures, but they can be taught. Just like everyone else. Some are just evil and they don't believe. Still, no matter how hard the truth hits them. You know, well, these individuals are evil and they will perish. Again, these precepts prove the so-called European man is Edom. And not Japheth either. Shalom.